Welcome everybody. I think we can start. Um, this is the first session of FAO ever on quantum computing in relation to agri-food systems or what we used to call food and agriculture in the past. Uh, welcome everybody. I would like to hand over soon to uh, Vincent Martin, our director uh, of the Office of Innovation. Over to you, Vincent Martin, for the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, and, and thank you for organizing this uh, innovation talk on uh, on quantum computing. I just wanted to say a few words and first of all, first of all to welcome uh, all the participants uh, here, but also the the great panelists uh, we managed to to have today to discuss about quantum computing, um, which is something uh, this discussion or this idea of having um, uh, this topic and as one of our uh, innovation talks started last year when we visited Geneva uh, and we had the chance to visit Geneva with Eric and also uh, our former chief scientist, uh, Isman, and we visited the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, GESDA. And I remember we had this great discussion on, uh, on quantum computing and, uh, and the, uh, its future application, possibly also in the, uh, in the field of agri-food system transformation. And I remember when I came back to Rome, I, I said to Eric, uh, let's, let's organize one of our innovation talk on this uh, on this specific topic and um, and I was very also excited to talk about it because I've always been fascinated by fascinated by quantum physics um, and I remember when I was a, when I was a student and when the first time I heard about this uh, experiment this uh, Schrodinger's cat uh, which is in a, which is in a box and its fate uh, depends on a uh, on a random subatomic uh, event and, uh, and this cat can be both uh, simultaneously dead or alive. And I, I remember that was our introduction to quantum physics. And I was really, not skeptical, but really, really amazed by, by this concept. And what did it mean in reality? I mean, it was interesting as a concept, but what did it mean in reality? And seeing that today in 2024, we are applying it to the concept of, uh, of computing. And the fact that by having this, uh, I mean, this concept of quantum physics applied to quantum com computing, and, and the experts will correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an expert in this field, but I think that's a translation of this concept in the uh, field of uh, computer sciences. Uh, I think it's quite amazing because we are seeing incredible potential of this, uh, um, of this, uh, of this new, uh, uh, new technology. Uh, in addition to that, and in, in the meantime, we also organized um, uh, a foresight uh, study last year to look at, uh, in FAO, we wanted to look at uh, what are the most promising emerging technologies and, and innovation uh, at the horizon 2040, 2050. And uh, part of these 20 most promising uh, emerging technology and innovation, uh, we found, of course, quantum computing. It was mentioned by all the experts and that it came up in our publication. But showing that uh, in this report that we published uh, last November, uh, we were envisaging that uh, it's, uh, it would reach a fuel maturity, I think around 2040, something like that. Um, and I, I'm saying it because I, I would very much like to be challenged <laughs> and, and, and to hear from the experts who might tell us, you know what, it's like artificial intelligence. Uh, a year ago, five years ago, we would see it as something uh, in a very distant future, but actually it's coming much faster than what we think, and it's opening the door for incredible applications. So, um, and I remember also when I, when, I, when I came back and I proposed to Eric to organize this uh, meeting on quantum computing, he, he kind of told me, uh, he kind of told me, you know, it's, it's a bit premature. Let, let's, let's wait a little bit. <laughs> but I think uh, we have all changed our mind and we can see that maybe it's coming uh, it's coming faster than uh, than we think, and and even if it's not the case, I think it's very important to look at uh, uh, how it's how it's evolving, and also what would be the potential applications in the field of uh, advisory for, uh, services for farmers or uh, climate change gamification, that type of things. So that was my uh, two words of uh, of introduction. Uh, to say that I'm very excited to to listen to the um, panel of experts uh, and to see what comes out of this uh, of this discussion. So we are uh, very fortunate to have 
so the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator. We have uh, uh, so we have colleagues who will speak from this uh, from this uh, from uh, GESDA, but also from the Open Quantum Institute and also from EPFL and also from FAO. So we have a fantastic panel of experts. Uh, I'm, I'm really thankful for them to attend this uh, meeting, to take all their time to be with us. And uh, and with that, I would like to hand you back the floor, uh, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you for opening the challenge to understand when is this ready. <laughs> um, <laughs> From here, I quickly go to uh, Marika Hood. She's um, the chief director from the from Gesta and from specifically from the impact uh, impact translator from Gesta. So, open over to you, uh, Marika. Welcome, and over to you for your uh, opening from Gesta. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, uh, Vincent, for the opening uh, remarks. Yeah, I thought I would start just explaining a bit where we come from as GESDA. So GESDA is the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator. We are a Swiss foundation. We were uh, initial, initiated by the Swiss government in 2019, but we have a global scope. And our uh, main objective is to help diplomats better anticipate future scientific breakthroughs. So what we do that in collaboration with over more than 2,000 scientists uh, everywhere in the globe and uh, in the five continents. And we work uh, on, uh, on around 40 scientific domains. The objective with this better anticipation of future scientific breakthrough is actually for GESDA to then develop and implement science diplomacy and uh, science diplomacy initiatives that will help us as humanity to better anticipate, better maximize the potentials of uh, those scientific breakthrough and, and especially ensure that the scientific breakthrough we have identified will uh, better benefit most of mankind and not just uh, uh, a few. So we, as I said, we work over 40 domains. Where we are the most advanced is uh, actually on quantum computing. Uh, we have uh, the work of JESDA has led to the creation of the Open Quantum Institute, uh, which was launched in March 2024, so this year, after two years of uh, design and incubation um, at JESDA. Um, so we collaborate with CERN uh, to uh, uh, operate this Open Quantum Institute, which has, uh, let's say, two main objectives. The first uh, objective is to broaden access to quantum computers. We know today they're in a, at, they're, they're available only at a very small scale uh, or in, let's say, prototype mode, but they are available. Uh, they are made available in particular by industry uh, providers like uh, to name a few, uh, through the cloud, you can access uh, quantum computers from IBM, from uh, Microsoft, but also from European companies like uh, Pascal, for instance, Oxford Quantum Circuits, and a few others. So there's quite a few quantum computers that are available already now. They are, again, small prototype. At, uh, kind of machines, but we felt, and uh, the JESDA felt with its science diplomacy community that we should already try and broaden the access to such uh, devices so that uh, um, then people all over the world, whether they are coming from a rich or less rich uh, country or community, can, um, uh, can experiment and most importantly, can experiment on real world applications that are uh, close to their local challenges. And that leads me to the second key objective of the Open Quantum Institute, which is to accelerate the understanding and the, uh, the testing of uh, real world applications of quantum computers that are uh, helping us advance towards the SDGs and beyond. 
And for that, of course, we had to start uh, with some priorities and uh, the Open Quantum Institute community scientists, the lead scientists uh, in quantum computing around the world, but also diplomats, have identified three areas of interest that would be worth some exploration. The, one of them is uh, food security and uh, uh, agri-food systems optimization. Second one is climate change mitigation, and the third one is around public health. So I'm delighted today that we are co we are co collaborating with the FAO for this um, uh, for this specific webinar because I hope amongst the participants uh, in this webinar we will have future future users and participants in this uh, great uh, endeavor that uh, is the Open Quantum Institute that some of you will be able to propose submit ideas of use cases that can help us uh, progress towards uh, food security. And uh, look, I'm looking forward to future collaborations with the FAO first. Thank you again for the invitation, but also uh, with you as uh, participants uh, of this webinar. Thank you, Marika, for opening. And um, thank you for explaining again everything around GESTA and the Open Quantum Institute. I think it's important. It's also nice that you make many linguages to the work of FAO. So yeah, I think it would be great to um, keep on collaborating in, in this field. I see that um, Vincenzo Savono, Savona has also joined. Uh, welcome, Professor Vincenzo Savona. Uh, you're the director of the Center of Quantum Science and Engineering in EPFL. And um, I learned that you're going to introduce us to the world of quantum computing. So uh, welcome. And yeah, I would be delighted to hear. We would be delighted to hear from you everything about uh, quantum computing. Over to you, Vincenzo. Thank you very much, Eric. I, ho I hope you can hear me. Uh, I will yes. uh, share my screen now because I will present some slides. Um, it's a it's a challenge in itself uh, uh, to uh, to be able to explain uh, quantum computers in ten minutes. Um, what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to. Uh, to explain uh, uh, rather than the, or try to explain rather than the how it works, uh, uh, I will uh, focus on what it can do, uh, because I think we are mostly interested in this today. Here I'm putting some fancy uh, pictures of very modern uh, devices. I will say a few things about this in, uh, in a moment. Uh, but let me start from a little bit longer ago. So uh, a very a very important concept uh, is that the information, whatever kind of information, and we are surrounded by information, requires uh, a physical platform to be to be stored, to be elaborated. So all information is physical. Okay, today everything that we deal with uh, is stored on computers or on paper, and even five thousand years ago, information was stored on physical objects. Okay, like these uh, ropes, uh, uh, knots and ropes, or like like this, like these clay tablets. Okay, so this is a this is a fundamental property of information. And today, uh, five thousand years later. Uh, Things have not changed much. Of course, they have changed a lot in terms of performance and what we can do. We have we have uh, found uh, new devices that are much better performing than uh, than clay tablets. But uh, but the, but notion is always the same. That information needs a physical uh, uh, a physical uh, uh, support to be to be uh, stored and elaborated. Okay. Uh, now I will say something which is uh, uh, perhaps key to the to, to quantum to understanding quantum computing which is the following. Uh, uh, simulating large quantum systems with uh, today's conventional computers uh, is a computationally hard task. What does it mean? It means that if we want to simulate, so to compute according to a model, the properties of a system that, uh, that uh, operates, uh, that, that, that is governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, this is a problem that is not treatable. Okay, it's uh, it's it's very complex, and you, we can uh, we can treat it on small scales. But if we want to simulate molecules or materials, as the size of these things becomes even uh, 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 slightly uh, big, then our computers uh, are not enough. So it's uh, the, the the size of the computational problem becomes uh, too large, and uh, it's impossible to treat this problem. Uh, uh, this is uh, really uh, traditional to introduce quantum computing with, the, with this quote by Richard Feynman, uh, one of the most influential uh, uh, theoretical physicists of the 20th century and the Nobel laureate. 
who, who is, uh, is uh, credited for having introduced the idea of quantum computing. Uh, this is his famous quote from 1981. And essentially the quote summarizes in the following thing that the, what I said in my first sentence uh, should not be seen as a limitation, but it should be seen as a resource. If, uh, if a quantum system does something that we can't simulate with classical computer, so we should see it the opposite way. A quantum system is uh, accomplishing a task which we may think of as a computational task that our classical computational tools, so classical computers are not able to do. And that, so if we could use quantum mechanics and the law, laws of quantum mechanics to design a new computational paradigm, it may be uh, more powerful and more efficient than the current computational paradigm. That was the idea. Uh, we now jump 40 years in the future to today, and uh, in, especially in the last five years, uh, here I'm just showing the two random plots that show how some, some quantum computers uh, have uh, improved over the last five years. Uh, the, the, the improvement uh, is absolutely tremendous because uh, uh, the performance of these devices, uh, although as Marik has uh, correctly uh, highlighted, uh, they are not yet uh, uh, at fruition, so at, at, at the scale where we, we can really use them to some advantage. But the, the progress uh, is uh, exponential, is similar to Moore's law, and there is no reason to, to think that this will not continue in the future. Um, the, the, the investments in this field are enormous. Uh, this is a map of uh, 2023, almost uh, 40 billion invested uh, public investments uh, uh, worldwide on research on quantum computing. And also there is a growing uh, ecosystem uh, of companies. Uh, there are very many, I mean, uh, there's no, uh, we're not going to, to list them all, uh, but in many, many areas of quantum computing. So this, and with an investment, which is probably 10 times big, okay. Uh, we should think of quantum computers in the following way. Uh, today, we are like we were uh, with, with conventional computers uh, in the in the fifties, so to say, uh, uh, you know, today for today for classical computers, uh, we know that nano electronics uh, is the is the conventional approach, uh, and we don't depart from from it. So we all, all our computational uh, tools uh, uh, work uh, uh, using nano electronics. Uh, 50 years ago, it's yes, or 80 years ago, it was not like that. There were vacuum tube quantum uh, vacuum tube computers. There were mechanical computers. So it was not clear at the time which kind of technology would have been the election uh, technology for uh, for uh, for classical computing. Today, with quantum computing, is exactly the same. We have a bunch of different, radically different technologies that I'm highlighting here with these pictures. Some of them are more advanced than others, so I have scaled a little bit more than others. But in general, we don't yet know which technology. Uh, there may be a new one which which may be groundbreaking and may may take over all the all the current technologies. So we are really in a pioneering era where uh, 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 industrial development goes uh, side by side with fundamental research in uh, in, uh, in 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 this uh, in this uh, uh, quant in quantum computing. Uh, so what can a quantum computer do? This sentence uh, is really my message. <laughs> Quantum computers can solve some computational problems better than conventional computers. And then I, now I want to really uh, uh, put the, my, the focus on these two words, some and better. What, does, what do they mean? First of all, some. Some means that the quantum computer is not a universal tool. A quantum computer can, can address uh, efficiently some computational problems, not all of them, okay? There are, there are computational problems where, where uh, conventional computers are much more effective, okay? We are lucky because among these problems uh, where quantum computers bring an advantage, conventional, you typically call the quantum advantage, many of these problems uh, uh, have a, a very high societal benefit. So they are very important for our development in many, in many respects. And I will say a few words in a moment. The word better. So quantum advantage, uh, the advantage brought by quantum computers uh, doesn't mean that you compute faster. It means uh, something which is a little bit uh, more subtle. It means that uh, uh, 
quantum computing improves the way in which the time needed to complete a computational task uh, grows uh, with the size of the computational task, so with the size of the problem. Some kinds of problems are untreatable because uh, classical computers are such that uh, when you increase the size of the problem, the time needed to solve the problem grows so fast, sometimes exponentially with the size of the problem, that eventually for problems of a decent size, it will be impossible to address them. And, and we speak of quantum advantage when this, this growth with size is uh, uh, alleviated. So it's, uh, it's not as dramatic with quantum computers. And there are a lot of problems where this is the case. Uh, and this is why uh, it, is, uh, it is important to, to, to develop quantum computing because these problems uh, may be solved uh, whereas today we are only limited to very small scale. Uh, uh, there are uh, hundreds uh, of useful quantum algorithms. So using a quantum computer means uh, writing uh, a, a code like you do with a conventional computer. And we call these uh, quantum algorithms. And there are a lot of applications corresponding to a lot of quantum algorithms. I have here a list of some of them. I'm going to make them appear all together. Uh, you, have, you have certainly heard about Shor's algorithm, which uh, finds uh, prime factors of like numbers. Is it useful? A question mark. Uh, surely it led us to rethink our uh, our uh, digital security. Uh, it's not. It's it's the 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 the, the looking glass of of uh, of quantum computing. It's the most popular algorithm, but it's not as useful as as uh, the other ones. Grover's algorithm uh, is uh, is an algorithm that improves uh, uh, searching lar large databases uh, and solve optimization problems. It is an algorithm that will will all only work uh, in the in the far future because it is a fault tolerant algorithm. This is a concept that is a little bit complicated to explain, but uh, uh, it is very very promising and and it is very general. So it can it can be applied to uh, to a variety of different problems. Digital quantum simulation uh, is the original idea by uh, Richard Feynman. So use quantum computers to efficiently simulate molecules and materials. So this is one of the most disruptive applications because uh, it may drive uh, uh, progress uh, in drug discovery, mat material discovery, uh, therefore uh, in, uh, in health science, uh, in energy, environment, sustainability, and in all those areas where we need to simulate the molecules to predict the chemical properties, the physical properties, materials, and so on. Uh, quantum optimization and quantum annealing, uh, these, are a, these are a class of algorithms where you can solve uh, approximate optimization problems more efficiently than with classical computers. And here again, this is a class of problems that are ubiquitous uh, in many uh, applications which will span from industry to environment, food, transportation, energy, uh, climate, uh, and we will talk about uh, application of optimization to food in a moment. And finally, there is an area which is very exciting uh, of quantum computing, which is called the quantum machine learning, where uh, some quantum algorithms have been proven to, uh, have been shown to, to uh, improve uh, the performance of artificial intelligence tools uh, and therefore they are very promising given the development of artificial intelligence and its importance in today's world. And uh, this is my my 10 minutes account of <laughs> quantum computing uh, and I will uh, leave you with these uh, considerations uh, which are essentially a summary of what I've said uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, an outlook for the future. And by the way, I wanted to say that uh, I'm very happy to to hear that uh, that that, that uh, in, in this context uh, you are very cautious uh, in uh, in predicting when quantum computers will be useful. I live in an environment where quantum computing is so hyped and people are so crazy with it that uh, that uh, uh, I hear numbers that are much much so. I hear that next year everything will be solved and so on. So I'm very I'm very happy and to 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 listen uh, to to hear that there is this more uh, a, a cautious approach to, to quantum computers. Nobody knows. If, you, if, if someone tells you, I know that in 10 years uh, it will be a reality, that uh, is the certainty of this statement uh, proves that it is a lie. Nobody knows when this will be available, but hopefully in a bunch of years. Thank you. I'm, uh, I will stop here. <laughs> and Thank I'm happy you so to much. Questions. 
Thank you so much, uh, Vincenzo. We do a QA and a at the end of the session. Uh, first, we have two other sessions. Uh, but it was really nice, Vincenzo. I really liked your graph with the, the, the two lines and, and the one where um, quantum computing can help with exponential uh, problems. So that's great. Um, so now we have lined up as a speaker, uh, Rutendo Mukaratirwa, and she works for the FAO Land and Water Division. And she's an agroecological zoning programming specialist. And she makes the connection with a possible um, use case for FAO. And I'm not going to oh, reveal I that will, one. I, I, will I like leave that. One. Okay. Vincenzo, you're saying something? I, I was trying to unshare my screen and okay. was having trouble. Now it's done. Thank you, Vincenzo. Over to you, uh, Rutendo. Uh, I think you're still muted. Um, and if you can make the presentation a bit shorter because we're running a bit over time. Can you try again? We cannot hear you yet. Um, yes. Yes, now we now can hear okay. you. Great. Oh, over okay. to you. Can you uh, make it a little bit shorter because we're running a bit out of time? Over to you, okay. Rotendo. Okay, thank you. So I'll try and make the presentation a little shorter. And here I'll also um, thank you, Vincenzo, for the introduction. And I'll discuss just a few um, of the algorithms that we could maybe implement. So here I'll be talking about quantum computing applications for um, policy making. And we're using a case study of the global agrological zoning and also um, AgroAdapt Cultivate the Future, which is a simulation game that uh, we created. So firstly, what is um, um, GUYS? And GUYS dataset is a methodology um, developed by um, the International Institute of Applied um, Science Analysis, and it's used for assessing agricultural resources and potential. And this matches crop-specific uh, requirements for climate, soil, and terrain resources under assumed levels of input management conditions and providing maximum attainable uh, productivity and crop yields. So the different data layers, we have up to 300,000 um, layers of data, and this has a size of up to um, 10,000 terabytes. So um, why is this uh, data set uh, so important at the moment? And this is because it has uh, three major goals that it achieves, which is sustainable development, um, especially for SDG goal 1, 2, 3, 12, and 13 early action, um, emergency and rehabilitation. So this is to address the natural hazards, human induced crisis, and um, also livelihoods that rely on agriculture for subsistence. And uh, most importantly, policy formulation and planning. So the knowledge sharing plays a key role in building resilience and achieving and maintaining food security in the future. So this is the main um, part in which we use guys data um guys data set uh, for policy formulation so firstly we need to understand the uh computing um the current computing capacity on a classical computer for the guys data set so just imagine just for one crop simulation and we can give you an, um give an example for maize um, running under 20 different land utilization uh, types. So this is different input levels and different land use types characteristics. And under just one climate scenario, and if we look, we have five different climate scenarios, and this takes up to one day. And in the guys data set, we have um, up to 52 crops with uh, 20 land utilization types and five different um, climate scenarios. And this is equals to 60 scenarios for each crop. So to simulate um, all of this, it takes several months, um, depending on the extent of the crop um, within the global region. So next, we'll look at the policy uh, making issues within the ag food system and how guys data set um, is used. So the main problem we look at, we see is the lack of effective decision making and policies among key stakeholders um, in securing the agri-food um, system. And what are some of these consequences, which is inefficient policy implementation, reduced agricultural fields, and the social and economic disparities? And what are the causes, which is um, data and climate change, data on climate change and the effects of the agri-food system in the future, 
policies that are disconnected from the local context and also the resistance to change due to skepticism and economic constraints. So um, the guys data set uh, looks at the first one, the first cause, which is data on climate change. And through our simulations, we're able to give um, policymakers more information of what um, the situation within the future could look like. However, there's it takes such a long time to run these different algorithms. And the next question is, how can quantum computing uh, solve this issue? So we've tried to solve this issue firstly by creating a game, and this game is called AgroAdapt Cultivate the Future, where the unpredictable nature of climate change becomes a central narrative. So firstly, what is AgroAdapt? An AgroAdapt is an education and user-friendly simulation game. And it changes from the traditional um, climate change processes as it, it employs an innovative approach by giving stakeholders a gamified and collaborative experience using the data from Guy's data set and also decision-making strategies for three major agrological agricultural stakeholders, um, which are the policymaker, the farmer, and the community leader. And also it translates the um, complex simulated future scenarios into an interactive and gamified experience, allowing the users to easily understand um, what would happen to the ivory food system in the future. And the platform allows the users to explore the implications of the climate scenarios. So firstly, we'll I'll play a short video about the components of the game, and then I'll show how the guy's data has been used. Okay, sorry, I think we didn't have sound, but I hope that you were able to read. Those are just some of the game um, components. So how we use the uh, guys data is firstly we have here, which is the guys data set, and this is all pre-processed and can be found um, on the guys data viewer. And then we created fictitious countries, um, just uh, using different shapes all around the world. And then we did some zonal statistics and within the zonal statistics, you're able to get information about that certain um, area. And these are, this is all just static data. So we have the data for the temperature, precipitation, soil types, and that cover. Then at the bottom here, you can see the climate disasters, and this is where the simulation happens. So for the example of rain last year, it's an area where there's high precipitation and flooding is um, the disaster that could most probably occur and it has the highest probability. So first we want to see, the next step is we want to see how can we use quantum computing within the um, agro-adapt framework. So firstly, we have three steps which we would like to change and which we want to see can quantum computing help us in this way. So firstly, the players will be able to select um, their own country. So whatever country or region you're in, you're able to select this, uh, whether it's a national scale or sub-national scale. And here we're able to process the data. So step two is processing the data from um, on guys data set on guys um, on the fly using quantum computers. So instead of having pre-processed data, we can have data that is now processed on the fly depending on the country um, you're in, depending on the different algorithms that you would like to input and the different models. And thirdly is the policy formulation currently with the guys, um, currently with AgroAdapt, we have about um, 10 different policies for each of the stakeholders. But with um, quantum computing, we can have large data sets which can be pulled and um, the players would be able to get um, policies for their specific region. 
So um, the near futures are, are the users will be able to get the data to access data from anywhere in the world. The second is the real-time processing and to add different models. And lastly, is to access the larger data sets or uh, policies. So what is the benefit for quantum computing? As And as Vincenzo said, um, there is optimization. So we would like to optimize it um, as quantum computing is um, handles extremely complex data and makes and is faster than the classic uh, computers. So for policy making and agriculture, this means you can analyze and optimize the land use, water resource, and the crop yields. Secondly, is the quantum um, for machine quantum computing for machine learning, and this can significantly um, enhance predictive models. For um, instance, the quantum algorithms and manage the large data sets with greater accuracy, speed, and um, help policymakers forecast the agricultural trends. And lastly is the um, global data accessibility. And um, with this, the users can access the process data from anywhere in the world. And some of the limitations um, that we have um, we could face is that the technology is still um, very new as Vincenza um, highlighted. Um, so the theoretical and practical challenges to overcome this um, is very difficult. And currently um, for the guys data set, uh, we're collaborating with the Mississippi State University using the high performance computers. Secondly, it's very expensive to maintain and operate the quantum computers. And um, lastly, it's the capability issues. Um, you have to be very knowledgeable to use these algorithms um, rather than and adapt them from the classic computer infrastructure into the quantum computing infrastructure. So thank you very much. And I am open for questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Rotendo. And indeed, that's a fascinating uh, idea. I, I can only think of how much uh, money it would save if we would have quantum computing that prevent bad policies to be implemented. Um, but I won't, I will stop here and I go quickly over to uh, Kat Catherine Lefebvre. She's the senior advisor from the Open Quantum Institute and she will continue talking about, also with Vincenzo, about more possible use cases in this space. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for having us. I will very quickly uh, just share how at OQI we, we explore use cases for quantum computing and then pass it on to Vincenzo who will uh, deep dive into one of the use cases he's been leading. So what we found important at the Open Quantum Institute is to bring quantum experts with the domain experts, like the previous talk, uh, we just, the speaker we had, to really explore and understand what are the mathematical um, formulation of the problem and where quantum computing could, could help making it more efficient, uh, bringing more accuracy. Um, and then also we bring UN organization and, and large NGOs to assess the impact and, and validate that it is a real world problem. So having these different angles make sure that we are really leveraging where quantum computing can really provide an advantage and making sure that we're not feeding the hype, but also um, focusing on, on real world application. And so we have put together teams that are working for instance on optimizing global supply chain uh, impact of, of food and then impacted by, by climate change. We have team working on plant genomics, uh, looking at the functionality and, and understanding more on the chemical side, uh, which function of, which part of the gene is, is responsible to a specific function. And then also looking at uh, the critical role of organic nitrogen in, to crop yield instead of rather than the, the inorganic nitrogen uh, that is used in fertilizers and so on. So we have different angles specific for food, but also, uh, also uh, looking at other SDGs as Marek said. And there's one, one use case team that is really uh, making a good progress at the Open Quantum Institute. It is on, on food production to produce nutritious food, uh, taking into account environmental, uh, cultural, and economical factors and, and passing it to, to Vincenzo, who can explain in more detail this collaboration that we have with different universities and, and as well with GAIN. Thank you. 
thank you, uh, Catherine. So uh, I'll uh, take over from here, but very briefly because uh, uh, I, I I prepared this uh, quite quickly. Uh, so essentially, again, I'm I'm sh I should share my screen. Uh, I realize. Um, so uh, as Catherine said, we are we are uh, we are addressing uh, the problem uh, of. Uh, uh, food produ food production uh, in uh, let me see if I can okay food production uh, in uh, um, in in geographic in well defined geographic areas. Uh, the idea is to uh, to use uh, quantum computing and in particular optimization to uh, improve various aspects of food production, so the food system in general. Um, so the, the, we know that uh, global hunger is uh, is increasing, uh, uh, as FAO uh, has uh, has uh, uh, assessed, uh, and uh, the problem is uh, uh, to optimize uh, global food, food production, accounting for various aspects. Uh, uh, among the, the the one we're interested in are nutritional aspects, but also societal, environmental, and economic factors. This addresses several SDGs. Of course, the main one is zero hunger, but there are at least a few others that are addressed uh, by by uh, by this problem. Um, so the, the 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 challenge is to increase food production and to uh, to, to 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 optimize food production to maximize a number of uh, of uh, of features. Uh, the main one is nutritional value. So the idea is uh, would be to do to 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 achieve uh, uh, full autonomy in which uh, in which a, a certain geographic area can produce all the food that is needed to to pro to to provide uh, a good nutritional value and complete nutritional value for the population. But with one would also like to increase food diversity, affordability. It is very important uh, production yield uh, to produce food in an optimal way so that it can be stored uh, not uh, not too long and so increase the freshness. Uh, uh, minimize environmental up, um, impact. This is uh, this is uh, the other. Uh, main goal of this uh, of this use case, and also maximize the societal benefit in general. Uh, um, when you have all these requirements, uh, the, the the food system optimization uh, becomes uh, a large scale optimization problem with very very many variables, as in the example that I will show in a moment. And uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, these systems, these problems are solved using a commercially available classical computer uh, uh, software, uh, like for example, Gurobi and Baron, which is quite quite famous. Uh, and something that I like is are these hardware optimizers by Fujitsu that uh, that uh, can be used together with their software to, and they are very efficient. Okay. So the question is, can quantum computing uh, uh, contribute to this? And uh, let me give you this example. This is a work we have been uh, uh, we have been uh, inspired from. Uh, it's it's a it's a work about uh, about uh, uh, multi objective optimization of food system. Uh, they uh, they look at different aspects, uh, but uh, but again there are many many. Uh, different objectives that they try that they try to achieve and uh, the reason why i'm showing this is is, is because, is because uh, if you apply this uh, even only to to some uh, to some uh, local reality like tomato production in the region of argentina uh, this model that they developed uh, ends up uh, having uh, hundreds of thousands of, of variables and this is a very recent work it's quite interesting because it is a very good introduction about uh, about the food system optimization okay so th this just to say to 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 highlight that these problems become uh, uh, very quickly uh, huge and uh, conventional computational tools may be may be uh, may be struggling to to solve them so uh, this is why we started uh, uh, this uh, uh, this collaboration, uh, which is currently one of the use cases of OQI, but which was a strongly uh, um, uh, stimulated uh, and inspired by uh, by Jesda, and which addresses some of the SDGs. Uh, you can find uh, at this web page uh, the, the the specific uh, uh, use case, and the collaboration uh, is. Uh, so the, the, the project consists in using uh, quantum and quantum-inspired optimization algorithms. Uh, quantum-inspired means uh, these are algorithms, uh, new algorithms that uh, work on, on conventional computers, but which uh, 
behave better than uh, existing algorithms because uh, because uh, they are based on some so on, on the on the laws of physics and in particular of quantum mechanics. And uh, the idea is essentially to 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 provide a proof of principle that uh, these uh, these these uh, quantum and quantum inspired algorithms can improve. Uh, uh, the results uh, in uh, in this uh, multi-objective optimization of, of, of global food systems. Uh, the collaboration, uh, uh, in addition to uh, myself at EPFL, uh, um, includes uh, um, Francesco Petruccione at NITEX uh, and the, the fantastic uh, food scientists uh, at, the, at GAIN, at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, uh, for, uh, from uh, where, where uh, I learned a, a lot about food science. And, um, and that's pretty much all. I mean, I'm not going to go into the detail, uh, but this is a very exciting project that, that has been on, ongoing now for a few months. And we are uh, switching gears and we are trying now to get to the first uh, 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 implementations and proof of principles. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vincenzo. Catherine, would you like to add, or you, this is uh, the board of you, right? I think uh, with for interest of time, we can uh, we can excellent. Start doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo and Catherine. Uh, then we can go to uh, Q and A. Um, I'm trying to. Uh, oh yes, here. So there are two questions from um, from Tamin Hale and uh, Puli Kotil. Um, I I think they could be combined. So maybe I can route them to you, Katrina, and maybe Vincenzo, you can help there as well. So the question is, what is the role of quantum computing play in sustainable farming practices, precision agriculture? And then the next question adds to that sustainable animal production and especially climate smart milk and meat production. Uh, Katrina, could you maybe start giving this a go and maybe Vincenzo can step in as well? Yeah, I think that's a hard question. <laughs> the, 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 the typical answer from quantum expert is, uh, let me understand better. I need to understand the, the mathematics behind uh, or the how can we re properly model this. But, but it, oh, in terms of um, climate modeling and weather forecasting, this goes into a class of um problem where we can uh, we can really model the dynamics of using for instance fluid dynamics so you can model more accurately uh, with better prediction the movement uh, or the dynamics of, of of what is behind weather um so there is a using a system of equations so of partial differential equation solver for instance that can uh, really be helped by quantum computers so this is one class of problem that can be tackled by by quantum computers indeed um and then in terms of looking at uh, climate effect on, on meat production and, and milk production i i would really need to understand a little better what what is the challenge even computationally with a uh, um, classically what we do um, but it may be very much an optimization problem just like what Vincenzo presented with multiple uh, objectives that we want to optimize and uh, it taking into account the impact of of climate and and nutrition for production of meat rather than production of uh, specific crops that uh, that Vincenzo presented. So, uh, kind of a vague answer because it's a uh, the we would need really to dig into the the topic, but very open to do that uh, after after the call. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think this is a, a good answer to that, also in the interest of time. Um, and then I have a next question for uh, Vincenzo. And the, the question comes from Christian Bienik. And uh, if I may summarize the question, I see different approaches like mechanistic modeling, um, stochastic modeling and mathematical mo modeling. So Vincenzo, maybe you could say something of, about what types of modeling would work well with quantum computing. And maybe you have read the questions as well in the chat. Uh, so please, um, over to you, Vincenzo. Thank you, Eric. So uh, this is a very important question. Uh, um, 
the the uh, my 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 take at, at answering this question is that uh, perhaps uh, uh, the, the the most difficult thing in solving these uh, uh, these real world problems is exactly in finding the right model. So in developing the right model, um, I would say that. Uh, uh, so that there is not a, not a, a single solution, a single answer to this. This depends a lot on the model. For example, for on the sys on the problem. For example, for our food system optimization, uh, we know that we have a multi-objective optimization, which is, uh, I would say, given that we have to find an approximate solution, is a rather a stochastic uh, approach. But this is not. Uh, true in other contexts, for example, uh, uh, Catherine was mentioning uh, solving partial differential equations, which is a uh, completely non-stochastic. Uh, the, the the important thing to say here is that uh, uh, there are three steps. There is the there is the devising the model, which is a very much uh, a, a human intelligence uh, problem. So it has not, it has not much uh, to do with computation. Okay. Uh, then there is the mathematical part in which you translate the model uh, into a mathematical model. And this, this may be uh, uh, related to the tool that you have available. For example, if you have a quantum computer uh, 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 instead of a classical computer, you may, you may think of a different mathematical approach, which is more suitable for quantum computers. But in the end, the quantum computer only comes as a tool uh, to solve the mathematical uh, uh, declination of the of the problem okay so these two initial steps uh, uh, still remain to be done by 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 a, by someone uh, who with the right knowledge and uh, and this applies in general i see a few questions that are uh, all of the same kind can i apply it here can i apply it there uh, probably yes but uh, you must first develop uh, the right model for the problem that you want to solve and then translate it into, into the right mathematical form that is suitable to be solved on quantum computers with advantage. The, the, the good news is that uh, today we know that uh, many, many uh, problems uh, are such that they can, uh, can draw advantage for, from quantum computing. But then uh, for each specific, specific problem, we have to, 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 to go through these initial steps before saying, OK, now I run this on the quantum computer. Thank you so much, uh, Vincenzo. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, I think we are closing now the questions and answers in the interest of time. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and then um, we go, we can hand over to Henry von Bergstedt. He's a senior information officer in the Office of Innovation, and he will provide for the closing remarks. Over to you, Henry. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, I think today uh, would not have been possible, of course, uh, without the Geneva Science and Diplomacy uh, Anticipator, JESTA, and also the FAO Land and Water Division. Um, so I would like to thank our colleagues in the FAO Land and Water uh, Division also to make these great linkages with the uh, global agroecological zones and the gamification of policy making. So thank you very much, uh, Rutenda. Um, and also from us, a big thanks to JESDA and the Open Quantum Institute. Without your expertise, today would not have been possible. Um, at FAO, we are convinced that we need this kind of collaboration, such as with the JESDA and the Open Quantum Institute. And we are looking forward to continuing working with you. So thank you very much, Marike uh, Hoot, Vincenzo Savona, and Catherine Lefebvre for your excellent presentations. Uh, at the beginning, our director in the Office of Innovation referred to the FAO Global Foresight Synthesis Report called Harvesting Chains. And out of these 32 innovations that were identified, this report also identified quantum computing as one of the emerging technologies uh, for agri-food system transformation. And it states actually that the earliest time of quantum computing to mature is 2042. Um, but with the input of today, we can happily challenge this year and date. I know that Eric is using five years onwards as a reference based on his, his research. And I noticed, if I understood correctly, that JESDA uh, speaks about eight to 10 years. Um, so I think uh, the, the, uh, yeah, it's going much faster than, uh, than we were expecting. So whatever the exact time frame, we need to prepare agri-food systems for quantum computing. And we need to make sure that when this happens, it will be good news for agri-food systems transformation. 
uh, we are in a time, we are uh, still in time to prevent that this is actually uh, um, contributing to a deepening of the digital divide, uh, especially for low and middle income countries. So we are uh, happy that we launched and introduced the topic of quantum computing for agri-food systems transformation to a wider audience. And this is just the first uh, step. So we hope to have this, uh, this kind of meetings more often. But one word that uh, stands out is the word instant. So with quantum computing, the promise is that we can have instant gamification for policy making, instant impact uh, simulations and policy in, uh, interventions, instant crop advisory services for farmers, instant simulation models for the transition to sustainable agri-food systems, instant drought early warning signals, and also low emission farming advice uh, um, for every arable land in the world. And I would even add that maybe it can even provide us with instant happiness. So let's hope that this is actually the case for, uh, for everybody leaving no one behind. So what, what can we do to best prepare for this upcoming reality where compute power is almost limited, limitless? There's two things I want to, uh, to mention. One is the foundational work, uh, which is what we already have started uh, with AI and with data. So we need to increase our data and AI capabilities, AI ethics, the responsible use of AI and equitable AI, where no one is left behind. Secondly, um, um, the, uh, in the, uh, the second layer is the world of prescriptive analytics and decision modeling, optimization and simulation. This layer is very, very computive, uh, compute intensive and quantum computing will be very helpful there. Here we need uh, also some governance mechanisms to make sure that no one is left behind and that every smallholder farmer in the world will have access to the power of quantum computing as a new farmer tool through the mobile phones. So thank you very much and back to you, Eric. Thank you, Henry, for making various linkages. Um, yeah, I, I believe it is indeed important to, to prepare for this new reality of, of quantum computing. That of course, we cannot use it as of today, but this is coming. And um, I think we need to start thinking, how can we prepare already models that we we know that we cannot run today uh, that will be able to run on quantum computers. So um, then back to EF, a big thank you again to EPFL, um, Open Quantum Institute in Gesta. It was very good. We, we're looking forward to continue the collaboration. And I want to thank all the participants for joining. We hope to be back within up to one year, more or less, on this topic. But if you disagree that we should be faster on this topic, please let us know. We're always happy to uh, discuss this. Thank you very much for joining today and have a great day afterwards. Bye-bye.